I guess those of you the wastewater, how many have been through, uh, uh, they call it a compliance evaluation inspection? That's what EPA does every, every year on campus. So, uh, yeah, so you've, you've been uh, through the drill. For PCI, pretreatment. Oh, okay. For PCI, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's uh, strictly with the um, source control. Yes. Source control inspection. Yeah. Yeah, those can be pretty rugged, too. Um, yeah, and, and that's, that's how you monitor the industry as such. And, uh, yeah, for the pretreatment. Yeah. Um, now, I'm, I'm talking specifically about the MPDS, that's uh, National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, that's your, your wastewater discharge permit. But again, like I was saying, um, many, many of the tips and suggestions are pretty much generic any kind of inspection. In fact, uh, I sort of a, a, apply, oops, there we go, um, a, apply uh, kind, of, kind of some of the things that I learned. I was, years ago in my previous career, I was in the Navy and we went through inspections all the time. I was on a ship, a uh, USS Fanning, was a frigate. Um, Inspections would come on board for all kinds of things, you know, for engineering uh, evaluation or for nuclear weapons safety checks or whatever. Um, and there was always kind of a standard drill, so it was sort of a standard procedure we follow. And I, I kind of go along with that. You know, needless to say, if you're going to be out in front of an inspector, it sort of presumes that you know know your permit. Um, in fact, you know what? I, I forgot something. I'm supposed to pass out handouts. As we're getting started, so these are the this is the slides, and they're uh, pre pre uh, drilled with holes, so you can stick them in your, your uh, training button. And we got a few more people. And I hope I made enough copies. So far, so good. I'm gonna run short at some point here. I think I got them. Almost got them. The last two people might share. No, no, I think I got it. Even though there's like three more people than there were supposed to be. That's good. Thank you. Wow, just enough. How did I do that? That's amazing. Um, so, anyway, presumes if you go stand in front of an inspector, it sort of presumes that you uh, know something about your facility. And, and know what the inspector wants, and I'll go over that. So your permits, uh, our, our major discharge permit, um, no matter what facility you are, they follow a standard format. This is ours, it's 140 wonderful pages. Uh, that's the main permit for discharge uh, into the bay. Uh, but there's also, nowadays, what they call a regional, waste wa a regional uh, watershed permits. There's one for mercury and PCBs. There's another one for nutrients, which is just uh, put into force last year. And then, if you recycle water, um, your other facilities, I know East Bay Mud, you have recycling. I don't know about, yeah, Silicon Valley, everybody does. And that's under a separate uh, water reclamation requirements, uh, which is not specific to your plant, but you fall under some sort of a general permit. Um, in the older days, prior to a few years ago, it would be the 96011 permit. Um, in more recent times, they're trying to force everybody to go under a state general uh, water reclamation permit, which everybody tries to avoid. I'm not quite sure why, not on the water reclamation side. Um, one thing about permits, they always go by an order number. So R2 stands for Region 2, that's San Francisco Bay. The second number, of course, is the year that, that it was put into force. And then uh, the last series of numbers is whatever uh, the number of order was for that year. So it's kind of interesting, nowadays with the modern technology of Google, I can go online, I can go San Jose 0034, shebang, you know, first hit is, is my permit. So wherever I am in the world, if I need to you know, find this document, I know you don't have to keep a hard copy anymore. I just do that for nostalgia. And the, the permit format, and again, this is about knowing your permit. The permit itself, the, the permit order is very short, just 14 pages for our facility. And it goes into uh, seven, seven different uh, categories, the facility info findings. Uh, important one is the discharge prohibitions and the effluent limitations, receiving water limitations, and then uh, the permit provisions, which are a bunch of special orders that would be specific to your plant. And then the vast majority of all that paper, that 144 pages in my permit, um, or anybody else's, is, is all of these standard attachments. You know, uh, attachment A is definitions, the B and C are your, your own facility map and schematic. E, federal standard provisions, E, monitoring reporting requirements, this is all your laboratory uh, analytical requirements, and then a fact sheet, 
which is standard provisions for Bay Area H, uh, pre-treatment pre pre provisions. Uh, that would be your uh, PCI inspector would be following along with attachment H. So, you know, basically, uh, the real the real meat, most of the regulations in your permit are in those, those back attachments. And uh, you learn over time, it's an awful lot of material to digest, but you learn over time what's important. And, and the inspector, of course, he knows exactly what he's going to aim on. I actually uh, uh, bolded the things that are most important uh, in an inspection type of situation. So that's knowing your permit. The second thing, of course, know your, know your facility if you're... Uh, Representing your facility in front of an inspector, if you don't know, you know, don't know the treatment train really well, and, and this is a San Jose plant, and so the treatment train is, you know, grit removal, screening, primary treatment, two different secondary treatment areas, and then uh, the wastewater flows to filtration, then disinfection, then out to the bay, and know where your regulatory sample points, that sort of thing. Um, if you're not really strong on where your, where your uh, you know, how, how your treatment plant works and such, you know, the one thing you want to do is have your chief plant operator standing right next to you when you're getting inspected, or your chief maintenance man and your CMMS guy if, if it gets into uh, 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 preventative maintenance type of things. Um, and in your permit, if, if you're a large wastewater facility, if you're a small wastewater facility, you might have one, one operator who does everything, you know, takes the samples, Maybe, maybe one manager who puts this all into a monthly uh, self-monitoring report. If you're a large facility like ours, you've got a couple hundred people working on stuff like that. You've got thousands of meters all over the plant. We went through this drill several years ago about which specific meters are actually reported in our self-monitoring reports and which, which, are the specific, which, which are the specific data streams that then an inspector would be looking at. And out of all the thousands of meters, flow meters, pH meters, temperature, conductivity, everything else that goes on, we came down to about a dozen. Uh, those in blue would be for our wastewater compliance inspection, and those in purple uh, follow uh, for recycled water. Uh, so just about as much requirement for recycled water as there is for the, uh, the actual discharge of the plant. But specifically, you know, continuous meter for dissolved oxygen, pH chlorine, it's way out on the outfall. Uh, we have our enterococcus grab sample location, and uh, most of our uh, priority pollutants come out of that sample point. Chlorine turbidity um, in the filter building, and that's it for MPDS compliance, and then you get into a, a series of other meters that, that, uh, for, uh, for the uh, recycled water. Um, yeah, believe it or not, it took us some time. It was one of those things that grew up over time. We realized we, we ought to know what meters you know, that, that are really uh, regulatory that we could actually get in trouble. And uh, anyway. So once you know all that stuff, you know this is this is how it usually happens. The, the uh, EPA, in the past, the EPA has been doing all inspections. Uh, now it's water board staff in the last uh, year, year and a half or so, which is actually not quite as tough. EPA EPA would it would have a contractor do it, and, and it usually was somebody with like 20 years of experience, uh, and so you had to really be on your toes. Um, but whether it's EPA or, or local water board, they give you a call. They can they can actually drop unnoticed, uh, you know, by law. They can come in any time and say, okay, we're here. We're going to inspect you. Um, in practice, they give you usually a five-day courtesy notice, and so you get the call. Uh, last time we were called, it was actually it was uh, two years ago. Well, it was two years ago this time. It was just before the Thanksgiving weekend, the Wednesday before the Thanksgiving weekend. Got the call, and they're going to be there on Monday. And so it's like, oh, well, this is. Great, or excuse me, Tuesday. So we had one day to get ready for it. Uh, a couple years prior to that, it was uh, just before Christmas, and it was up during our Christmas, the, the big annual Christmas party, and, and the EPA was <laughs> dropping in the inspection. So, you know, don't be like Mr. Bill. You know, and now I realize I'm getting old, like most people probably, probably nowadays don't even know what Mr. Bill was. You know, he was the yeah, little guy who was, oh no! <laughs> he goes, you know, hi, I'm Inspector Danny Coleman. I'm coming to visit your plant, you know, in three days. I'm like, oh no! <laughs> you know, you want to know. You know, just, oh, uh, right off the top, well, how long do you think you're going to be here? Is there, what, what, what are the areas you're going to focus on? If, if this is somebody who does a lot of inspections, um, uh, uh, I'm saying Danny uh, O'Connell was the inspector, uh, uh, contract inspector for EPA. He loved CMMS. He loved to follow the work order system. He said, oh, okay, well, that's very good to know, because now I know who's not going on vacation next week, because i got to have my CMMS guy there. Um, other people might want to focus more on operations, maybe he's a pump maintenance guy, you know, who knows, but uh, uh, you want to kind of, if, if it's possible, he'll, if he'll divulge that information to try to find out, well, what, what, what do you think you're going to focus on? And uh, the checklist, um, 
they do have a checklist for MPDS inspections. Uh, hopefully, the inspector will give you his, his personal copy or, or one that he likes to follow. It makes his life a lot easier. They're usually willing to give that. It's a good idea to check, get that checklist. If you don't get it, you can get, you know, you can get a generic version online. So, you know, right after getting the call from Inspector Danny O'Connell or, or whichever inspector, uh, you know, happens to call you, you know, have, have a list of things that you're going to need to do. So yellow is the do it now while you, well, before your inspection. Orange is what you do on inspection day. And then green is, is what you do to follow up afterwards. So do this now. You know, get the inspection checklist if you can. Review the last inspection results. You should have on file your last CPA, whatever inspection. Again, you know, if it's whatever type of inspection it is, you should have, you know, you, you probably get inspected every year, every two, three years. And you should have on file, you know, your last inspection going back at least one or two cycles. You know, grab those things and take a look at them. See what, see where you got nailed before, if, if there were any discrepancies. And you can also get a sense of what the checklist would be from your previous inspection. Uh, of course, you want to immediately alert all the people that uh, were about to be inspected in the next day or two or three, uh, so, that, so that the right people stay around. Uh, get documents ready, perform a pre-treatment photo uh, an inspection, I call it a photo safari, I'll show what that means. And, uh, and then schedule an immediate meeting. You know, at least the day before or two days before the inspection, you want to have a meeting with all the principal uh, people you know, representing different areas uh, so you can talk over what you're going to do. <coughs> and then for the inspection day, you want to reserve a room somewhere at your facility where the inspector can sit down with a pot of coffee and a bunch of documents and, and go over things have all your subject experts standing by, uh, and then uh, have a vehicle standing by with a senior operator or other expert that can go, go along with you. And then a uh, plant manager needs to be around too. Um, but, uh, day, day one, when you're getting ready for this, you want to notify your plant manager that you're about to be inspected. And this is showing you, um, this is a typical uh, checklist for a compliance evaluation inspection. I got this one and I think about five years ago, it's still relatively current. It's just generic stuff. You know, you got to have copies of your permit, your last permit uh, uh, oh, uh, application package. Usually, uh, when you apply for a permit, every five years, right? MPDS inspection, M MPDS permits are extended for five years. So every five years, you got to reapply for that, and they, they, the inspector will expect to see that that last package, which is usually uh, hundreds of pages long. Somebody's got it. Um, you need to run that down and pull it out. Anyway, a whole, a whole series of things. You have it in your uh, presentation in tiny, tiny font. And, and if you, uh, you know, after this, if uh, anybody needs uh, a nice large copy of this, they can uh, contact me. I can do it too. And your last uh, CEI inspections is just showing you, like the last inspection that we had prior to the last one. Um, you know, a CEI type inspection, they only give you satisfactory, marginal, or unsatisfactory. Um, and so, you know, if I'm satisfactory, and again, this follows pretty much a checklist, but you'll see that we got a marginal, it had to be results of the latest uh, EMR QA study, and it was a laboratory, and they found that we were using the wrong nitrite, nitrite analysis, analytical procedure, so, so immediately that tells me, this is even before I send out the big email to everybody, it's like, I better check with the lab and see if they got that nitrite right, because they got nailed last time, and I don't want that to happen again. Um, and this is the email that goes out. Um, this is the actual email I sent. This was 2012, November 2012, so it was one and a half inspections ago. Um, and you can see I sent it out at 7.39 p.m. That's because Danny O'Connell gave me a call at 5, right before I was about to go home. I said, hey, Mr. Irvin, I'm going to be out there at your plant uh, next Tuesday at 8 a.m. And this was between the Thanksgiving weekend. I was like, that was like oh, no! And uh, so I sent around, banged out an email, told everybody, Inspection date and time, you know, the link to the previous reports, uh, the, the previous inspection report that you just saw on the screen, and uh, a link to the inspection document folder, which I'll show you the contents of that. That's basically all the checklist materials. Um, and then uh, the planning meeting, you know, since he's going to be there on Tuesday morning, and it's now Wednesday, and we've got the, uh, excuse me, it was Tuesday, and so we've got, you know, everybody's taking off tomorrow and going off on Thanksgiving weekend. I've only got Monday. That's the only time I got for everybody to get together. So I want, you know, I want the chief plant operator, I want the chief maintenance, the chief of electrical, CMMS, the plant manager, if, if uh, he or she wants to attend, to meet in a, in a conference room the next uh, next working day. Um, this is the uh, the folder. So um, I've learned over time 
you know, and whatever inspection type of inspection you're, you're, you're you know, whatever whatever your field is, if it's water or, or wastewater, um, you know, the, the typical inspection things that they want. In this case, for wastewater, you know, they want to see your your actual permit order. They want to see the permit application, uh, annual reports. So we got several annual reports that we have to provide at the end of each year. Um, uh, spill prevention con uh, containment uh, plan and uh, results of you know, all kinds of things. You know, contingency plan, operator licenses. All these things are put into a folder, basically, in the range. And uh, and then this is uh, basically the electronic file that when the inspector shows up, we, we have a laptop ready for him, and he can just start going through the documents. In the old days, I mean, and I'm talking old days, just like five, six years ago, before we were all electronically uh, arranged, uh, there's a big, big giant pile of documents. We just wheel them into a room and, and let them go at it with people uh, standing by, ready to uh, come by. And so uh, in a CEI inspection, they want to see that uh, all the operator certifications, um, operator certifications get updated, I believe it's every year, right? Uh, the, uh, this, this would be uh, through the state licensing. Uh, you have to be sure that no operator ever performs any operations uh, if his license is expired. Um, they have to reapply. Um, if uh, you do a cursory look through the list, this is this was generated a, a year ago, but if you look through the list and you see somebody who's like expired, uh, you better get them off the job like now and, and, and actually probably document that, you know, we, we did a little screw up here. Uh, but you should have a training coordinator on your plant site who is tracking these. Each operator should be very well aware of when his license is expiring, when he has to uh, recertify. And your laboratory certification, that's every year. Um, we attach the lab cert to our annual reports, so we always have an accessible copy, so we, we don't like lose track of where that, where that is. And little things in the permit, uh, these are attachment G requirements. You know, you dig into the permit, you'll find that you're required to revise or update or review your contingency plan every year. Uh, contingency plan for operations under emergency conditions. This has to do with um, how the plant is, uh, is, is able to respond to fire, flooding, earthquake, uh, loss of power, any other type of emergency. Every year you're supposed to review that thing. Most of it never changes. Most people just look at it every year, change the date, and say, yep, we're done. Maybe a few phone numbers. Um, but I've, I've known inspectors who came and say, no, 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 I want to know substantively what, what did you actually review? What, what got changed in this? And so you better be well ready to do the tap dance about, yeah, we really did look through our flooding plan. We really did look through our earthquake response. And, and in our case, it's uh, uh, flood management and, and uh, wet weather preparation is a thing that always changes. So I always know that there's some, some sort of a, a letter, a wet weather prep letter in, in the fall time frame. So I can always point to that. Um, you do have to have a spill prevention plan. This is for uh, sewer spills, release of, uh, of uh, partially treated or untreated wastewater. Um, if your plant is uh, fully burned and contained, you don't have to have an SPCC if you, if you read through the attachment G. Um, in our case, our, our facility is completely burned and we have a stormwater system that's all plumbed back to the headwards of the facility, so all stormwater. And so in other words, if any spill happens on the plant site itself, as long as it doesn't leave the containment area, it, it goes back to the system. So I'm not required to maintain a, se a separate stormwater pollution prevention plan or spill prevention plan. If you don't have that, then you have to have a spill prevention plan and, and it's got to be updated every year. I don't know, how are you folks with your, your facility? Do you know or, or do, you, do you track that? No. Yeah. Well, your folks at the plant should know. <laughs> yeah. And I hope they do, yeah. Um, and that prevents a, an unauthorized spill because the main uh, there's a couple things I'll get into that. They're, they're very sensitive about sewer spills. Uh, the state, they call it sanitary sewer overflows. And so anytime somebody in the public can accidentally touch the sewer water, you know, that's a health concern. Anytime the sewer water gets into waters in the state, well, then that's an environmental concern and a health concern. And so there's some very specific requirements for reporting and uh, preparation for that. And then there's a thing that's uh, it's referred to, uh, it's actually mentioned in, in attachment G. It's a requirement that uh, if you if, you, if your facility stores over 1,320 gallons of fuel or oil above ground, you need a Spill Prevention Control and Countermeasures Plan, an SPCC. An SPCC is not the same as a sewer spill plan. It's completely different. I've even had, I've even had uh, water board 
folks, uh, water board staff come on board and confuse the two, think that the SBCC has to do a sewer spill. It's like, no. And uh, nothing's more satisfying than telling a regulator you know more about the regs than they do. Uh, I love that. <laughs> but yeah, you are required if you have fuel, and we do, you know, right there, there's our, there's our 1,320 uh, Excess. And you might wonder why, why it's that oddball number, 1,320, it has to do with uh, international barrels of oil. And so I don't know what that equates to, you know, 50, roughly a 55 gallon drum and you multiply it. And it it's a, there's a threshold where it comes out to 1,320. But you do have to have, you know, you'll have like lube oil and, and fuel and such around the plant, different places and emergency generators that they're storing fuel. Everything's got to be, you know, secondary contained. Everything's got to be monitored for uh, accidental spills and things. And it's a completely separate requirement. And uh, and your SPCC plan has to be reviewed and updated by a registered engineer every five years. Many of my other plans don't have that requirement, but I have to have an actual registered engineer stamp on that plan um, and uh, and be able to show inspector. And because it's referred to an attachment G of my permit, now the inspector it's it's open for inspection by a CEI inspector. Um, and then attachment G attachment G. There's this big <coughs> not only attachment at the end of the permit, but all, all these things, like the SPCC, the, the contingency plan, and a wastewater facility status report. There are all these gotchas where basically anything on your, on your facility is open to inspection. So the uh, wastewater facility status report required in section D2 of attachment G says that you have to have this plan, a wastewater facility status report, that, that, that you, the dischargers shall regularly review, revise, and update to ensure that all facilities are adequately staffed, supervised, financed, operated, maintained, repaired, and upgraded. So, I mean, virtually anything, anything that goes on at the plant is, is open to inspection under this thing. Um, and I kind of, I've discovered, um, if you're into wastewater compliance, you'll find this is one of those weak areas where nobody's quite sure, even the water board staff isn't quite sure, you know, what what is that plan? And I, I find in the archives, like from the 1980s or something, an old wastewater facility status report, but it didn't really get updated that well because it covers everything. And these things change on an annual basis. There's no way that, you know, how my plan is financed from one year to the next is the same. The budget changes every year. So what, you know, I, I uh, racked my brain a few years ago about what am I going to do to make up this requirement? And what I came up with was, um, to just go ahead and roll everything into uh, our annual report. And I, I brought a courtesy copy. Got it. I don't know if I have enough for everybody, but um, go ahead and pass them out. Uh, might have to. I think might have to share every every couple of people. Maybe for a couple. Yeah. Um, you can you can keep or uh, keep or bring back to me if you don't think that's really good. But it it just. You know, every every year at your facility, you're required to provide all the wastewater uh, chemical information. You'll see that's in the first section of the report. And you go towards the back, you'll see that I take, you know, at every facility, you've got an annual budget, for example. And it gets put up in front of your board of directors or your city council. Um, and I basically grab, you know, a page out of that budget document and, and, and or put uh, web links into the annual report so that at any given time, an inspector can go by at my facility and you can see, you know, the org chart. You can see the personnel status, the finance, um, and uh, operations ma and maintenance and uh, CIP projects that are that are uh, in force. And uh, and of course, it's, we post this on the internet, so it's easily uh, downloadable. Um, and that was the best I could come up with. It seems to, to answer most of those questions. So, again, you know, use your annual report as your wastewater facility status report, and. Uh, and then uh, it shows on the table of contents that I'm going through how I'm, how I'm staffed, financed, supervised, operated, maintained, um, and so on. Now, another area that, that they'll look at, you know, you, you have, uh, you always have incidents that happen. You always have equipment failures that happen at your facility. Uh, and the inspector will want to see the last year of, uh, of uh, incidents. And so we, we use what we call due diligence reports or, or incident reports. And they're put on a SharePoint library. Um, and then the important thing with this is um, an inspector will take at random any one of these incidents where you had an equipment failure and you'll want to drill down into it. You'll want to ask, uh, probably talk to the cognizant operator or maybe go into the work order system and see what you did to uh, try to resolve that problem. In this case, I took the example of a nitrification blower that had an amp surge. 
Um, so the inspector's going to ask questions like, was the work order submitted? Did the part arrive? Was the problem corrected? What additional training, if, it was a, if there was a training deficiency noted? And uh, did you make any corrections to the, the standard operating procedures um, that uh, might be applicable? And so in this case, this shows a summary of the due diligence report that a work order was submitted. And then as you flip down, the, you know, the operator would go, this is where you have to have your CMMS operator uh, available during the inspection day. So you're going to pull up the files and be able to show that the work order was submitted and then ultimately go out to the, to the you know, power panel or wherever it is and see that the, the problem is actually corrected. I had a few inspections where they actually went to that, that level of detail. They said, I, I want to see the actual panel. I want to see the, I want to see the, you know, the switch, the, the relay that was replaced. Uh, and, yeah, nothing scarier than taking that walk out there and just thinking, God, I hope they fix this thing. And nothing's more satisfying than going there and, yep, they fixed it. My God. <laughs> um, and then uh, for the st standard operating procedures, uh, inspector will want to see, you know, in the old, old days, and there is a requirement in the permit that you have to have a, an operations maintenance manual. In the old, old days, it was just a, a nice binder. But the truth is, in a, in a very large facility, you've got hundreds of pumps and hundreds of hundreds of valves and meters, and uh, you, you don't have a manual, you have probably hundreds of manuals around the plant. They get updated, too, uh, every uh, every year or two for most of them. And so you, you have to have an electronic library nowadays. Um, I don't know, how, how are you folks? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, the transition happened, I guess, I, I'd say kind of, yeah, several years, several years ago, we were really wrestling with getting everything, everything electronic. Um, Prior to that, you'd have like vendors, vendors manuals and, and uh, sales packets from like 20 years ago, you know, because that was the last thing that was ever published on, on a pump or a valve or a motor or something. And slowly but surely, we've, we've populated that database. Um, makes things a lot easier. And so, before we actually have our, our meeting, and this would be uh, early in the morning, before we have our big uh, war room meeting, uh, prior to the inspection, um, I have a couple people in my group go around and take photos uh, around the facility. Um, this is after the inspector calls, says he's going to be there, so the next working day, we're out there taking a look for, you know, housekeeping, really more, more housekeeping than anything else, but broken equipment, uh, just nasty looking things, you know, I mean, just something as easy as just hosing down an area, you know, helps a lot. Or if you, you know, sometimes they, they pull a lot of stuff out of a trash rack or something and they just plop it right down there, <coughs> you know, wherever. And you're like, you know, inspectors don't want to see that. Come on, you know, clean it up. And so we go and take pictures, and this is really, I do this kind of, kind of to scare people. You know, say, inspector's coming tomorrow, folks. Do you want them to see that mess? Um, and, you know, go, you know, just do, I call it the photo safari, just taking some pictures. Now, some things you can't fix. You know, if you've got broken concrete, Something that, that's on a CIP, uh, Capital Improvement Pro Program, and it's not going to get fixed for a couple of years. That's okay, but just make sure that you got it taped off with the right, you know, type of safety, uh, you know, safety barriers, and, and that you can point it out. If the inspector walks by there, you can explain it that, you know, this broke way back when, we got a CIP project, you know, we're very well aware of it. As long as it's not in, in, in interfering with your wastewater operations, there's nothing wrong with that. But you definitely don't want to see a, you know, pump that's spritzing because, you know, the whatever, the seal water isn't, isn't sealing right and, you know, and, and maintenance just hasn't been performed. Those things can be fixed on the spot and should be. And so after I do my photo safari, uh, use that as a handout, we do our, our, what I call the war room meeting, and we pull together all the uh, managers of operations and maintenance and electrical <coughs> and instruments and, uh, and go over uh, the inspection and then that, that inspection checklist I was just talking about and having everybody, you know, aware of what the last inspection was, um, and, uh, and, and if there was a discrepancy from previous inspections, I want whoever the manager was in charge, you know, to be there to kind of take a look and say, okay, yeah, we did fix that, or we didn't, or I'm going to go find out right now and make sure it gets fixed. And so the big day arrives, the inspector shows up at your plant, it's always a nice touch, you know, if the plant manager will come out of the office and, you know, shake hands with the guy and show he's interested. I, he or she, um, I've never, I've never known a plant manager that, that didn't hop out and want to meet the inspectors they come in because you know it can really ruin your day if you get a bad inspection. Um, and then uh, have the room ready by and you know and a room reserved so that the inspector can basically 
sit there, I call it the think tank, uh, typically in the uh, CEI inspection. The inspector will be there reviewing documents for almost half the day because he's got, he's got a pretty good stack of documents. Um, and along with maps and charts and things and flow diagrams so that you can go over things. Coffee, donuts optional. Um, after, after he does his uh, sit down with all the documents, and it usually takes three or four hours, he'll spend at least an hour going to the laboratory and typically with the wastewater inspection, and, and you know, it probably goes with any other type of inspection, but he will look at your monthly SMR reports for the last, last few to several months and he'll basically he'll take one or two or three uh, data points and say, okay, I'm going to follow this one all the way back to you know the sample receiving, to the chain of custody, you know, into the laboratory, look at the analytical method, and so you know he's taking that SMR and he's bouncing it against your laboratory records. So you want to make sure that you got like we've got a laboratory with about 20 people in it. I, I don't know what's typical for most of the others. We're a lot, very large plant. But you have you have a lab manager, lab supervisor. Yes. Whoever your lab person is, you just you want to make sure that person is going to be there for the inspection. We we had one that ran really late uh, one year. The inspector, for whatever reason, he got to the lab very last, and we literally caught our our, our, our chief lab technician who, who runs the uh, runs the uh, electronic system as he was going out to his car was about to take off. And, uh, you know, I, no, no, John, come back, come back. Just 20 minutes, 20 minutes, and just need to show the inspector something. Because uh, it, it would have been tough, you know, without him being there. And, and you just want to make sure the right person is, is there so you're, you're not having to waste the inspector's time and everybody else is trying to open up records. Um, after he gets done with the lab, the inspector will, will go around the facility. Uh, this is usually the afternoon thing, the last thing he does. Um, he usually goes in order of the treatment train. So you start at the, uh, at the raw sewage wet well and looking at all the, uh, the bar screens and the grip chambers and such. And just, just looking for basically anything that, uh, you know, signs of bad housekeeping or, or poor operations. You will always make a beeline right to the raw sewage sampler. A uh, raw sewage sampler has to be refrigerated, has to be flow composited. Um, and then it goes to, the, of course, the primary clarifiers, looking for scum buildup. You always have the guys hose off the uh, the, the grease and uh, grease separators uh, before he comes out, so you don't have nasty looking things. <laughs> if it's a well-run plant, it should always look nice. Um, shouldn't have to do anything special. Uh, and secondary, uh, any signs of, uh, of pin flux or other floating material in your clarifiers. Not necessarily an inspection hit if you have that, but you have to be able to explain why. You know, is that a typical operation? Are things not not operating well? And uh, or is it causing any other upset? We have filtration at the back end of our facility, so a little pin flux is, is really not, not uh, meaningful. It's, it's something we want to avoid, but it does not harm our, uh, the, the, the quality of our final effluent. And, and looking for, uh, you know, looking for nocardia. You know, the worst thing in the world is to uh, walk out there and you have a nocar nocardia bloom going on, uh, a lot of scum on top of the secondary clarifiers. As long as you knew about it and you're responding to it, and the inspector gets assurance that you, you're on top of it, that's not a problem. But if it's a big surprise and it's only discovered while the inspector is standing right next to you, that could be a problem. Um, oh, one thing we're demonstrating too. Um, this was uh, so our guy uh, Brian was acting in the role of inspector. He's actually one of our staff members, but we have uh, one of our chief operators there as well. You know, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go on a tour around the plant by myself with a, a, an, an EPA inspector. I'm going to have a chief operator with me because the operator can, it can, it will supervise his operation, can tell, tell the inspector, can explain to him, you know, how things, uh, how things run at the plant better than I can. Uh, you just want to, you want to put a good face on things and, and give the inspector assurance that, that, uh, that you know, your plant is confidently run. Uh, again, the final effluent sampler is also flow proportion and uh, has to be refrigerated at 0 to 6 degrees centigrade. And he will check the thermometer and see uh, that you're doing that. And then the final stop on your tour is your, uh, your plant off ball. And again, again, housekeeping, you know, maybe uh, before the inspector comes out, take a look down that, that outfall channel to see if everything, you know, if there's dead fish out there, you're in trouble. <laughs> I don't care what they say. Um, and so after the inspection, hopefully everything went well, and there'll be a debriefing meeting with the plant manager. And then a nice touch is always, you know, do the personal thank yous to everybody in the team. So this is my 
thank you message a few a few years ago where you know, call out people by name that uh, you know the, the chief operator that goes along with you, the laboratory people that, that made sure the records were, were straight and, and uh, spent some time with the inspector um, and let everybody know what the overall results were. And so again, that's uh, the sequence of events, and hopefully everything went well. And Anyway, getting beyond the inspection itself, I was going to talk about a couple of things, uh, a couple of kind of the details when you get into uh, uh, get into your permit and, and areas that you need to watch out for. Um, again, this is the standard format for uh, your uh, NPDES permit, and then those those key those key things that you must abide by all the provisions and the, the discharge prohibitions, effluent limitations. That's basically your, your quality rate effluent. Uh, your uh, attachment E is the monitoring reporting program. This, this governs how the lab takes all the samples, how often they take samples, and uh, what analytes they have to be looking for. And then attachment G is all the gotchas. So, yeah, the things that you must do in any MPDS uh, situation is you have to keep records. That attachments D and G tell you that. You have to meet your effluent limitations, and that's, uh, again, attachment E more than anything else. And you have to report spills. That's that's a big one. Um, and usually, you know, with any collection system, and so certainly any large sewer plant, you have little spills that happen, you know, on the plant site at least uh, throughout the year. In fact, collection system like San Jose, you know, hate to hate to put it out there for the public and such, but we do report. We have we're required to report every single spill. And over the course of a year, we have about I'd have to check with last, but I'm going to say I know it's over 100 spills a year. Usually they're small. Usually they're very closely contained. Usually they just wet the pavement and they're quickly cleaned up and, and such. Um, virtually none of them in San Jose in the last few years have made it to an actual waterway or a creek, but it does happen. You know, when we, well, I'll tell you why it hasn't happened in the last few years because we've been dry years, but now we've got El Nino coming. And you know, all it takes is, is uh, the SFPUC folks talking before this. You know, a, a big two by four gets in the sewer somehow, or, or a, you know, big clog of something, or who knows what, a sewer break. Um, and you know, and you have flooding in the streets, and then you have you know, the water going into the creek. Has to be has to be reported. You have to estimate the amount of water that you think went out. You have to report it within two hours of becoming aware of a sewer spill. And you know, it's like, of course, we immediately know whenever a sewer spill happens, right? It's like, no, usually you find out at 2 o'clock on Sunday morning. And you have no idea when it started. And all you can do is make your best guess at how much water actually went out. Um, in any case, um, for keeping records at a, at a large facility like ours, you find um, one, of the, one of the daunting things is that we have various databases and uh, means of keeping records. And so you've got got records scattered all over the place. Laboratory puts everything on, on, a, on a, a, a laboratory reporting system, a LIM system. Uh, flow is all through what we call our, our NOVAX system. It's a, uh, you know, it's a database system that uh, is keeping flow uh, directly from the meters. And then we have a distributed control system that, that, uh, that keeps track of, of, of uh, basically all the grit and skimmings and biosolids. Um, and also uh, the, uh, all the uh, chlor chloramination and such, the disinfection process is all on DCS. And then operator logs you have to go to for uh, bypasses and overflows and spills and such. Um, you just have to be aware and you also have to be, be sure that uh, people are trained on how to keep records and uh, when to report things. Um, you also have to uh, be cognizant of the quality of your wastewater effluent and, uh, and any, any type, again this gets into spill reporting spills and other contamination that might happen on your plant site. Um, there are general generic uh, requirements that, you know, I can't, can't have my receiving water with floating suspended material, discolor, discoloration or turbidity, um, so supposedly, you know, odors and things. Uh, so, so basically, operators who go out uh, once every shift and take samples at the final effluent, they have to be taking note of odors, discoloration, or, or possible, uh, you know, other upsets that might be happening. Uh, same thing in the raw sewage. We sort of got nailed on this one. So we don't have a specific requirement to keep track of the quality of the raw sewage coming into the plant, but we got kind of, uh, it was a minor discrepancy a, a few years ago because we went to the raw sewage wet well, which is what this is, and the raw sewage was coming in was looking kind of inky black. And the inspector said, well, in fact, 
Because we have Santa Clara comes in one line, San Jose comes through the other, and there's a San Jose with black and the Santa Clara with brown. And so you have these two colors of sewage coming in. And it's like, well, that's interesting. How long has that gone on? So, well, you know, it's been only a few to several months. We don't really know what that is. And, uh, you know, it's like, uh, wrong answer. <laughs> He's like, well, do you keep logs of that? Mm, no. You know, when, you know, when you saw the color change? And no, no, we just thought it was the weirdest thing. And anyway, I mean, we found out, you know, shortly after that, uh, that, yeah, it was because they're doing um, uh, ferric chloride addition upstream in the San Jose side for odor control, and so that's causing the, the blackness in, in one side. But, you know, it, it just shows that it looks really stupid when an inspector comes out and you don't know why some of your sewage is black and some of your sewage is brown. And it's like, well, don't they keep records around here? Don't they? Uh, <coughs> Anyway, I thought that was interesting. So I, don't, I didn't have a specific requirement to monitor the, the quality of the incoming sewage, but, but there's a, it, it really goes under uh, kind of due diligence and, and just uh, standard, you know, I guess standard operational cognizance of what's going on. Um, so ever since then, we've told operators at least, at least daily, you know, just make note of, you know, things look, look okay. Um, and that's record keeping and then discharge specifications. There is, nowadays, they standardize the permits, so you have uh, a table four, yeah, which, yeah, which is in your attachment E, attachment E, yeah, and uh, it's, uh, it's showing you all, all the different, um, uh, I guess, permit limitations that you have, your monthly average limits and your, uh, your weekly or maximum daily limits um, that you have to keep track of. Um, and again, it gets into one of these things in a larger facility. It's like, well, where exactly are these samples taken? You know, how do they get to the lab, the chain of custody? Um, and so we have some are some are uh, analyzed continuously by meter. Some are daily grab samples. Some some are uh, what we call C24 composite samples, 24-hour composite samples. Um, you know, be cognizant of how how those samples are collected and that, that operators are trained and know how to turn them into the lab, and that you can follow the chain of custody through. And, you know, some, some less frequently, monthly and quarterly, uh, uh, some of the priority pollutants that are only done uh, uh, less frequently. Uh, I forgot to add that, they pop those in this thing. And then uh, you have your uh, uh, toxicity testing. In our case, it's quarterly for acute testing and monthly for uh, chronic testing. I guess those of you folks, if you're not, if you're not really into this, then you probably don't know, but it's, it's, um, you have a, we have a fish test. Uh, it depends on, on your facility. Everybody has different test organisms. Um, I was kind of curious. Does anybody else know what your, what, do you know what your test organism is? We got rainbow trout. Yeah, there you go. And uh, I think mussels? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ed edulous, uh, purple mussel. Yeah. Uh, Middleus, middle edulous, I think you call it. We have uh, seriodaphne, which is the water flea. Um, it's specific to your facility. It depends on, on the what, what kind of uh, water you discharge to. It's you know as a compliance manager, and I realize you folks aren't specifically compliance, but I, I like to I like to use that as kind of it's kind of my test. And it's like do you know your facility really? I mean if you if you're if you're in compliance at your plant, you don't know what your what your organisms are. It's kind of like why well, wouldn't want to be you in front of an EPA inspector? Because I mean, I you know I know what those organisms are. And the inspector, more often than not, he's going to want to go see the, the you know the actual laboratory area where this this test is done. And um, now we you know we go with the contract laboratory, so we bring in a stock of fish and rainbow trout. They have to be larval rainbow trout, so little guys. They have to be cultured and they're brought in. So uh, more often than not, the laboratory is empty. There's nothing in it. Uh, but on the week that we do the test, then they bring in a shipment of the little fish and they put them in their, their test tanks. And you have to control the water and the pH and the conductivity and everything else, try to screen out all the variables and those fish basically swim in effluent for uh, a solid week for about five days and then you count the number to die. That's your acute test. Acute, acutely toxic means does your wastewater actually kill something. And when it's chronic toxic, it means over a long period of time, uh, through the life cycle of the organism, uh, is it causing an inhibition for some critical life function? In the case of seriodaphnia, we're measuring for reproduction. If you're doing the muscle, I think it's fertilization. I, I believe they, they have uh, the muscle put up little gametes and try to see. I think, I, I don't do that test, but I think that's what the thing is. The urchin is similar. Um, anyway, urchin, urchin is a 24 hour test. I think muscle is, this is a five day test, seven to five, five to seven day test for seriodaphnia. And they basically have 
seridaphne will reproduce three times and then see how many uh, little neonates are formed. And, you know, it's kind of fascinating but kind of ridiculous, but, but nonetheless, um, we, in 20 years, since 1994, we've never, ever failed the fish test. The seridaphne test is really variable, though, and that one, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get uh, little glitches in it and then have to do additional testing and, and evaluation and such. And all the while, I've got fish swimming to my upload channel. You know, and anyway. Um, and then you also have your uh, bacteriological testing. In our case, it's enterococcus. Uh, five times a week, you have to uh, inoculate uh, a Petri dish with effluent to see how many colony, colony forming units you get. We don't have a permit limit for fecal coliform. We don't normally perform that test, but there is a water quality objective, and you have to be below 200 colonies. So this is basically a test to see how well your disinfection is working. And then I don't, I don't really get into water reclamation requirements as much, but these are what they are. So turbidity, total coliform. In fact, water reclamation has a lot less requirements than, than discharge into the ocean. In fact. You know, believe it or not, well, we're a shallow water discharger in, in San Jose. Our requirements uh, for chemicals constituents are actually more stringent than drinking water. Because fish live in the water, you know, you only drink water. You're like a visitor to the water world. You don't, you know, you're not as sensitive to most of the things that the fish and other living things in the bay uh, are sensitive to. So anyway, we have all these process samplers around the plant uh, for, and this is really uh, for operations management. So taking different samples and seeing what your mixed liquor suspended solids and, and uh, pH and, and other constituents are, uh, to make sure your plant is running well. But there's only two of those samplers are regulatory. The inspector will never ever care about you know what your raw, what your primary effluent or your secondary effluent looks like. He only cares what your raw sewage, raw sewage sampler that it's up and running that's refrigerated, zero to six degrees, and, uh, and that's flow proportion, and the same thing for the effluent sampler. And uh, I guarantee you that when the inspector comes out to your facility, he's gonna to wanna to see that sample, sampler and, and that one, the, the raw sewage and the final effluent. And again, he'll wanna get into, uh, he'll, he'll wanna look at a few, if several, of your regulatory meters, and in this case, it's the blue, the highlighted blue, uh, because he's an NPDES inspector. Um, and those meters, uh, one thing we found, they're continuous meters, so they're 24 hours a day. And this would be for chlorine or turbidity or pH. Um, and, of course, they're continuous, but every meter has to be maintained at some point. Uh, every week or, or so, they have to be calibrated. And when they calibrate, you know, what's, what happens? The meter pegs out. And you, get a, you, know, you have a continuous record that shows that you pegged out. Somehow you have to keep track of when was it maintained, or if, if you see a peg out, was it because you know an operator went out there and put it, put the you know the probe in a sampler? Um, and we went through a program back a few years ago to try to try to document um, every every single you know maintenance event so that it wouldn't be confused with an actual uh, violation. And so we have signs on all our meters telling the operators that you know that you only maintain that meter at a certain point in the hour. That way, that way, if it's at the top of the hour. Or, or uh, excuse me, if it's uh, if it's at a certain period of time, then I know that it was a maintenance action. In fact, in the case the chlorine meters, is kind of special, and this is what <coughs> goes for all uh, San Francisco uh, dischargers. They they require you to have a continuous meter, but they only regulate you based on if you have an exceedance at the top of the hour. So for God's sake, you don't want your operator maintaining that meter, doing any kind of maintenance action on that meter. Uh, at the top of the hour, so don't don't service this up this meter ten minutes before or five minutes after the top of the hour. Um, for uh, turbidity meters, it's just a matter of we have uh, alternate meters we electronically or by switch have the operators uh, switch the alternate meter if you're going to maintain it. it. It's common sense. You know, maybe it makes it sound confusing. And for grab samples, um, for uh, for your outfall samples, the pH, dissolved oxygen. Um, you have 15 minutes. The operator has to log into the lab and show that his sample is collected no more than 15 minutes before he arrives at the lab. So, in our case, our facility is fairly large. You have to train the operator. Like you don't, you don't stop anywhere. You don't take a coffee break. Grab the sample. You go straight back to the lab. You don't go do something else for a little while. No, no, no. You go right back to the lab, and you make sure that the time of sample collection and the time that you deliver to the lab is no more than 15 minutes apart. 
Uh, we got we did get nailed on that a, a couple of years ago. Never ever since. Um, so yeah, the the real and then this is generic for every plant. You know that uh, an actual uh, discharge prohibition. You must never ever discharge your treated wastewater at a location or in a manner different than as permitted. So all all the treated wastewater has to go through whatever your your designated outfall channel. Some some plants have alternate uh, outfall channels. We have only one. Um, and you can't bypass uh, any untreated or partially treated wastewater. So you know you that treatment train from you know from headworks to primary to secondary to filtration. I can't bypass filtration at any time unless I notify the water board, and it has to be for a good reason. Um, and uh, of course, your your input flow. There's there's a certain a million gallons per day that your plant is rated, and so you you're uh, you're never supposed to have more influent flow than, than, than what you're permitted for. I mean, obviously you can't stop sewage from flowing to your plant, but you, you can notify the water board if you're, if you're finding that you're going over that. Um, and uh, sanitary sewer overflows, any spill of sewage out on the streets is uh, prohibited. And uh, this is just this special rule, they, uh, this came up uh, 2008. In fact, yeah, this is the water board order 2008 um, They uh, this was as a result, it was uh, Marin, I believe the Central Marin uh, Sanitary District, they had a, a major, a significant sewer spill. Um, it caused a lot of consternation and they came up with a new rule where you have to report any sewer discharge within two hours of becoming aware of the State Office of Emergency Services to your local county health officer uh, or, uh, or uh, emergency communications switch and uh, to the uh, water board staff itself. Uh, uh, those three calls in succession, um, and they had a further requirement, still in the permit, uh, that 24 hours after the initial notification, you have to send certification, which could be an email to the water board, and then five days later, a written report to follow up if there's anything else. Um, the water board has since uh, kind of relaxed that a little bit, said, no, you know, just, just a written report within 24 hours is all you have to do after that initial call is made. Um, so. You, know, you only have two hours, and a you know, spill can happen at any time. You want to make sure that people on staff are pretty well aware of who's going to make that call. You know, I don't really need ten people all making the call at once, and I definitely don't want everybody thinking somebody else did it. So, generally speaking, you know, we always have 24 hours a day. We have a uh, shift supervisor or shift uh, four person who uh, is in charge of plant operations after hours. That's that's the guy who's going to make the call. I mean, he'll. Notify the plant manager. Plant manager can can opt to make the call if he or she wants to, but but generally speaking, it will be that that 24-hour duty person. Uh, and then, uh, in our facility, we're a large facility. We have a communications room that, that assists the the, uh, the the senior guy. But uh, shift supervisor will, will inform either have the computer room make the call for him, or or the computer room will provide information so he knows to make that call. It's a pretty simple call. You know, State Office Emergency Services, 800-852-7550. You can call them anytime. I call them once in a while just to make sure the phone's still working. Um, they got somebody on duty 24 hours, and they say, you want any spill, right? Any spill at all? Yeah, and, and that goes for even like uh, fuel oil spills, uh, things that are not sanitary sewer. Um, guy told me, yeah, I, sometimes I get calls from people for like a thimble full, you know, Somebody with an outboard motor is on a reservoir and he spills like a, a thimble full of water and he calls and they log it in as a spill. They, they don't care. You know, it's, you can do that. And, and not only that, you're actually, it's actually the law. You're required to report it. Uh, as, as, as trivial as that may seem, you can get in a lot of trouble if you don't make the call. And uh, so I try to encourage operators, shift, shift supervisors, essentially, don't be afraid to make that call. If you think nobody else is making the call, it doesn't matter. And even if they do get 10 different reports, don't worry, we can, we can sort that out on Monday. That's, that's not a big deal. Um, local health officer, you just have to find, uh, for us, we have the Santa Clara County Communications Center. It'll be different for every, every place. Um, the main concern there is if you have sewage in the road uh, where the public can contact it, you want to make sure they get, they get the call. And then the Regional Water Quality Control Board, they have a spill hotline, 622-2369. Uh, within two hours. Uh, in fact, if you make the call to State Office of Emergency Services, they say they will follow up and make the additional calls. I don't trust them, but they say they will. Uh, but that's the most important one that you make. And they'll give you a log number, too. Um, and that, kind of the same sequence goes for spill of oil or hazmat, but you have a 24-hour window, not two. 
um, and again, five-day working, uh, working day written report. And then um, there's also, there's a separate rule, it's the, uh, uh, there's a federal rule uh, for uh, oil or hazmat, and so one barrel of petroleum, and you have to call, again, the same sequence, so uh, Office of Emergency Services, County Health, and uh, an EPA gets to the, uh, to the waters of the state. So, um, if you understand all that, and I, well, I, I left you a handout, because I realize there's a lot of information in there, but um, I hope that helps. I think I ran out, ran out of all time, but if anybody has any questions, I'd be, be happy to. Yeah, so I hope everybody had a good training day.